Welcome back to the History of Rock podcast. His name is Brandon. He's the DJ. His name is Shim. He is the rock star. Class is in session and we have traveled around the rock world where we talked about Lollapalooza. We talked about the three different Woodstocks. And of course, after talking about Woodstock 99, you got to talk about the old Limp Biscuit. I'm so happy. I can't express how happy I am right now. The only other band I want to talk about more is Silverchair, but this is going to be better because Brandon grew up listening to Limp Bizkit. Yeah, oh my God. For anybody who who tuned into the Rockstar 101 or anything, like I was, I mean, and I looked like Fred Durst. I had the the same kind of goatee. I even wore like a red backwards New York Yankees hat, and I don't even like the Yankees. I was invested in the Limp Bizkit, my man. So yeah. we're going to talk. Yeah. So for this episode, we're going to focus on Three Dollar Bill, y'all, which was their debut album. Uh, and then next episode, and probably the next two episodes, we'll get more into Significant Other, which was really the breakout album. So that's the one that mm-hmm. had Break Stuff and um, uh, Nookie. Nookie and and My Way. Or no, I think My yeah. Way was actually after that. Uh, Rearranged right. was on Significant Other. But anyway, so yeah. we wanted to start with this uh, here for Three Dollar Bill, y'all. And uh, one of the big things too that you can expect coming up here in the uh, kind of middle to the end of this episode is you have that whole counterfeit controversy um, where, oh my God, Limp Bizkit paid a radio station to play their song. And we're going to get more into this later, but we have an advantage that a lot of other people do not. And that's that my former boss, who I worked with at NRQ down in Eugene, Oregon, uh, he was the assistant program director slash music director of the radio station that made the deal. He was at yep. the table with the Interscope reps when they did it. And there's some stuff in there. He's like, and yeah, nobody talks about that part of the story. That's And fantastic. it's not what you'd expect. I, it's not what you'd expect, <laughs> man. And this is the thing. $3 bill you all did not make it over to the to Australia at all. The first thing not we ever heard fake? about Limp Bizkit. Nope. Nope. I think maybe a little bit, but there was, I remember that period. That was the period when I was really, really paying attention to everything music-based. And the first thing was Nookie. And when Nookie came out, it blew up 100%. But I think it was because on $3 Bill Y'all, they were still kind of an indie grimy band. Nookie was the first time was like big video, big production. We're going to blow this band up. It was off the back of $3 Bill Y'all where they went, okay, this band's pop and we're going we're gonna to blow them up. But the sound and the look of the first record was not nearly as highly produced. It was grimy and indie yeah. sounding. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, we're going to start off here with the members of the band. Obviously, you have Fred Durst. He is on lead vocals. You have John Otto. He was on drums. Sam Rivers was the bassist. Wes Borland, the guitar player. And then, of course, on the ones and twos, Mr. DJ Lethal, which I can bring this up now because I don't think we're really going to cover Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water, at least not right now. There's the outro track on that album, and it is fucking hilarious. I it's love ben, that. Yeah. It's Ben Stiller. Do you, do you yeah. know which one I'm talking about? Where he's like, I know it, and I love it. I love oh it. my god! Like yeah. he, it's because he's he's in a studio and he's like, it sounds like he's mocking Limp Biscuit when he really is mocking yeah. Limp Biscuit, but you can tell he's kind of friends with Fred Durst, and he's he's like, I'm yeah. totally limping with the biscuit. I'm totally limping with the yeah. biscuit. I'm totally limping with the biscuit. And then he's it, like, it, and, the whole, and he's like, starts, did you? It starts off with him saying, "Fuck Limp Biscuit." Yeah. Fuck those guys. Yeah, and, and that's gets, the thing. Fred's number one thing on stage was to get the crowd to say fuck Limp Bizkit because he was just he knew everyone hated the band fuck you guys we fucking hate you too so there's no way that that didn't start with and I think Stiller was high there's no way that didn't start with Fred being like yo get on the mic and just start by saying fuck Limp Bizkit because that's what he did he told everyone to say fuck Limp Bizkit and then they get that beautiful sound by oh my god yeah. yeah so for anybody who has not heard the outro to Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water Go listen to it. Whether that's Spotify, yeah. Apple, whatever it is, go listen to it because it's fucking like. At one point, it's like, did you grow up with DJ Lethal, Fred? <laughs> it's like, and is that is that that is that what you called him, DJ Lethal, when you were kids? Because I guess this is what his is mama what, named him. Is that what his mama named him? <laughs> oh, little DJ Lethal. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. Anyway, so yeah. that's the band, and then we also have they've been nominated for three Grammy awards. They never won a Grammy award. Sold over forty million records. Uh, released 26 different singles, and then they also won. Uh, they've won other awards other than Grammys. Some of the ones of note are like the Billboard Music Award for Top Modern Rock Artist in 2000, and also the Billboard Music Award for Maximum Vision Award for Nookie in 1999. Maximum Vision. Yeah. See, that's the thing. If people ever wonder, like, why does Fred Durst the way that he is? Why does the band not give a fuck if anyone likes Limp Bizkit? It's because they sold 40 million albums. 
when they well, sold could, albums. I mean, you could tell that he, he I mean, he kind of, he was like that to begin with. Um, like the way no, he was things, calculated, man. Yeah. Yeah. But he was, also he was a, a businessman. Yeah. That's why people hated him. That's why people, the, the reason that artists fucking hated him was, I, I think we talked about this last week. They just didn't like that a businessman beat them in their own game. He just took all these parts. He just took all the parts. It was like when you saw Limp Bizkit for the first time, you were like, yes, that's what we want. That's exactly what is happening right now. We need a DJ. We need a little X factor on the guitar. We need a great rhythm section, a little bit of the corn thing where the bass is upright, but not too much. And then a guy that just looks like the guy next door who raps okay and sings okay, but I can relate to him because he's not amazing. That's it's so fucking on point. It's so yeah. on point. And then Lincoln Park came out right afterwards. And I remember thinking when Lincoln Park came out, this is and I've I've gone on record as saying this, and I had to eat my words every day. I thought Lin I thought Lincoln Park was going to tank. No I thought Lincoln Park was going to shit the bed. Well, oh, I well, saw them on MT What? I I kind of agree with you on that. Because I remember specifically we were all hanging out at a friend's apartment. MTV might have been on, and they were running an ad for Hybrid Theory, Lincoln Park's right. first album. It was a, it was an advertisement, yeah. you know, with a with a hit single, um, "One Step Closer," and then they, it yeah. plays like that clip, you know, "One Step Closer to the Edge" and everything. Yeah. And my immediate thought was, if they got to advertise these guys, they must suck. That was really? my first thought. Okay. That was my first thought. <laughs> So there's two main things that I took. We're going to get back to Limp Bizkit in a second. One, I saw the video for One Step Closer. And I just remember thinking, this is a record label's attempt to manufacture the next Limp Bizkit. And Linkin Park used to hate that they were put in the Linkin... The Linkin Park hated being put in the Limp Bizkit category because they had a real MC and they had been a real band for years. And they were like, dude, we're just doing our thing. But I remember I watched it and I'm like, this is too perfect. This No one's going to believe this is real music. It's too in the moment. It's literally Limp Biscuit with a real singer who's a great singer. Yeah. And I fucking had to eat my words because I love that record. <laughs> I love that band. It was just my initial reaction off the first single. And then I saw the same thing in a local rag magazine back when they had them. L full page ad, uh, Linkin Park, Hybrid Theory, Money Back Guarantee. And that was what made me buy the record because I thought if you're willing to give a money back guarantee on music, that's going to be a good record. And I remember thinking everything I do when I'm famous, I do mark it my words, for you. No? I literally said all my stuff's going to come with a money back guarantee because then people will you'll put your money where your mouth is. And I, I stole that and I still use it today. Every time you, I sell a ticket to anything, money back you, guarantee. Or you'll, or you'll be broke. Yeah. Limp Biscuit. Back to it. Before Limp Biscuit, Durst played in other bands such as, and by the way, I don't know any of this information. Split 26, Malachi Sage, Malachi, Malachi, Mal Malachi, Malachi Sage, I don't know. Malachi Sage and 10 Foot Shindig. Wow. Um, Sam Rivers was the bassist in Malachi Sage and Durst told him, you need to quit this band and start a band with me that's like this, rapping and rocking. Rivers remembers his cousin, remembered his cousin John Otto for the drums. Recommended. Sorry, my bad. I'm fucking trying to roll with it. Just rolling, rolling, rolling. Rivers recommended yeah. his cousin John Otto for the drums. Otto was studying jazz drumming at the Douglas Anderson School of Art, playing in local avant-garde garage bands. I did not see that one coming. John Otto that took it to the Matthews Bridge yeah. went to avant-garde art school. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> So yeah. Durst we're in named, heaven right now, guys. So Durst named. Oh God! Wait till. So you like some of the bands that Fred Durst was in before Limp Bizkit, Just wait till we get the other names he had for Limp Bizkit, which we're getting to right here. Durst named the band Limp Bizkit because he wanted a name that would repel listeners. According to Durst, quote: "The name is there to turn people's heads away. A lot of people pick up the disc and go, Limp Bizkit, Oh, they must suck. Those are the people that we don't even want listening to our music." Unquote. Other names Durst thought of were Gimp Disco. Fantastic. Split Dick Slit. <laughs> bitch Piglet. And Blood Fart. <laughs> you couldn't even get that one out. Blood Fart. Well, and it's wow. funny because when you look at some of the, like, uh, Split Dick Slit and Bitch Piglet are, it's basic, it's the same thing as Limp Biscuit. It's one, then two yeah. syllables. Yeah. But Limp, Say the fuck. thing is, 
Split dick split. <laughs> <laughs> split, split dick split. split you couldn't they would they wouldn't have put that in stores and bitch piglet they would have found that it would have, it's too punk rock limp biscuit makes sense so limp biscuit was so big locally that sugar ray who had a major label contract already opened for them yeah damn okay they were that they so were they got big pretty quickly they were fucking huge in jacksonville uh, Jackson and they would Bay. play this they would play this bar called the milk bar and owner danny wimmer stated that limp biscuit had the biggest draw for a local band. They went from playing for 10 to uh, ten people to 800 within months. Fred was always marketing the band. He would go to record stores and get people involved. He was in touch with high schools. Yeah, that's smart, because they were a high school band. Durst would pretend to be the band's manager to promote the band to labels, but they would gain, but they would gain crowds with their cover versions of George Michael's Faith and Paula Abdul's Straight Up. That's smart. Going and posing as the band. So this is assuming before they had a manager, he would just be like, yo, I manage the band. He put on a suit and tie, go he would, and do no, it. He would, call, he would call him up. He would call up the radio. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he would call up the record label and he'd be like, hey, uh, this is so-and-so and we're working with this band. And then he would name drop other bands and he would make them sound bigger than they were. It's kind of yeah, what they smart. were doing. Yeah. Um, Business. Early on, they did toy with the idea of bringing in a second guitar player. Because if you think about it, you know, uh, like look at Korn. Korn, two uh, guitar players. you got Head and Monkey out there. Uh, yeah. Borland determined that wasn't the answer to something that they needed. Instead, they brought in DJ Lethal from House of Pain, which, by the way, that first House of Pain album, I think it's the, the first one. I can't remember if there was anything before, but the one that has um, uh, Jump Around on it. Oh, my God. I could not have listened to that album anymore when I was younger. That album is mm. so fucking amazing. But it was <laughs> around this time, though, when they brought in DJ Lethal, Borland actually left the band due to creative differences. Not to be confused. I didn't realize with, he left. Not to be confused with when he left in 2001. Like he left early right. on. That's not a good start. No. That's not a good start at all. Limp Biscuit opened for Korn and wound up doing two tours with them, gaining them even more popularity. Limp Biscuit eventually signed with Mojo, a subsidiary of MCA Records. See, I could say subsidiary properly, but but not the other thing. While they were on their way to California to record their first album, they wrecked their van. As a result of the near-death experience, Durst was able to make amends with Borland and get him back in the band. Well, isn't that romance 101? <laughs> That's lovely. Well, there was a, di a dispute with Mojo, and Limp Bizkit ended up signing with Flip, a subsidiary of Interscope Records. Fieldy of Korn was able to persuade producer Ross Robinson to listen to the band's demo, although he didn't actually listen to it until his girlfriend convinced him like hey this is this is worth because ross robinson kind of a big guy you'll get from this from this next uh uh little tidbit here but that was always one of the big stories is that limp biscuit opened for corn and oh and fred durst was also a tattoo artist not the best tattoo artist and oh god see and i should know off the top of my head i think it was head head or fieldy who he tattooed and they're like right. his tattoo sucked but <laughs> the music was good and then that's kind of how yeah. they, they they became friends and Robinson, excuse me, had produced Korn's first two albums and Deftones Adrenaline, among many others. That's a nice resume. The mood and tone set in the studio by Robinson allowed the band to improvise a lot. One of those improvisations ended up being on the album as last track, Everything. By the way, I am not familiar at all with $3 Bill Y'all. I never really listened to it. Really? I listened to Significant. No, never got into it. I, I listened to it once and I was like, ah, the production's not as good as Significant Other. And I would just go back to Significant Other. Poser. Fucking yeah, poser. 100%. I didn't wear a fucking hat, bitch. You were a poser. So despite the, sp uh, the success of the live performances of Faith Robinson, he didn't want them to put that on the album. Um, however, Sorry. they were able to convince him with a final version that they had done, which had uh, heavier guitars and drums, along with DJ DJ Lethal on the ones and twos. Or something like he's. You Could know, you imagine? Was was Faith the first hit or was no. Counterfeit? Count well, Counterfeit was the first single. Faith came after that. And we're obviously going to get to that here in a little cool. bit with all the counterfeit so, stuff but yeah like that like, like imagine imagine not having that yeah so, like they, they might have still made it but i mean that's yeah. really wouldn't have been the explosion yeah so in 1997 they had unfavorable reviews the first reviews of limp biscuit were unfavorable shock while they were on tour with corn and helmet including milwaukee journal sentinel music critic john m Gilbertson, the, the who criticized Durst, <laughs> who criticized Durst's performance, stating, 
The one attention-grabbing moment of Limp Bizkit's rap thrash show was when the lead singer expressed a desire for gay men to be stomped, which isn't remotely rebellious, it's just puerile. Great. Great, yeah. great set of fucking reviews. Oh, and this goes right into this next one here. So later that year, they toured with Faith No More, and they had difficulty with the Faith No More fans. The group's guitarist, Roddy Bottom, said, That guy, Fred Durst, had a really bad attitude. He was kind of a jerk. I remembered he called the audience, uh, it's an F word that rhymes with maggots, at one show when they booed him. Not a good scene. Jesus. Yeah, so he was, well, yep, all right. So he was infamous before he was famous. Yeah. <sighs> oh, now here's the good time. This is the good stuff. So this is when we get to All talk right, about the go. album, the counterfeit controversy. And so this is one of those stories that it, the more that I looked into it and I got to speak with Al, which was great catching up with him. He was a great boss for my time. I was there a very short time in, uh, in Eugene. I was there less than a year. Um, but I listened to Al growing up on KUFO. He was the midday guy and he's got that, that radio voice and he's, He's fucking hilarious. He was just a great boss to have. Um, and it was even better when I got to hear stories from him. Like, he would tell me. So he was the one that when I would talk about or I would ask him about Lane Staley. Like, what was Lane Staley like back in the day? Because Al yeah. went through all of that stuff. Like, he was yeah, there yeah. at that time at working at the radio stations. Like, when he and I were talking about this stuff, I mentioned that we started with Mother Love Bone. And he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, dude, he's like, I remember going and seeing Mother Love Bone back in the day. He's like, multiple times they would come through. He's like, checking him out. Like, he's, that's a dude we need to just bring on and talk yeah. to. Because we I'm need sure, to do several episodes. Al, if you're listening to this, we definitely want you to come on, man. Because he's 100%. got stories for days. So he was the assistant program director slash music director for KUFO in Portland, Oregon. That was the big rock station. It doesn't exist anymore. It's no longer around. It's the death of the rock radio station. In the United States. Like, that's why I think the people in El Paso for KLAQ, I don't think they realize how lucky they have it. Because there are right. not a lot of rock stations like that around anymore. Like, most right. of them have gone away. Um, so, uh, they were the ones that made the deal with Interscope. And now you can, I forgot, you actually have one. Sorry, um, you, uh, yeah, we've so this. Coming back to me. <laughs> Sorry, I missed my pickup on that one. There are a lot of things that get misconstrued about this story. I don't know the story. So, I mean, I know the concept, but here we go. The big misconception is probably whose idea the pay for plays was. And the answer is it was KUFOs. I did not see that one coming. Al said that it was an idea that he had, that they had for a while, but needed the right band to make the deal with. They wanted a band that they had faith in pun intended <laughs> he didn't say the pun by the way like I, i'm not gonna put that on him i'm not gonna put a terrible dad joke on al i, I put right that but he did say that and you're gonna hear that here actually i got a bunch of clips here from when i got to sit down and talk with al and so shim had asked i can't remember if it was in the episode or when we were pre like recording last week's remix uh, is, is al giving away confidential information and i asked him that because i wasn't right. sure <clears throat> what can be said and what cannot be said. And Al goes, no. He's like, no. He's like, the uh, the statute of limitations ran out. He goes, everything's fine. And I'm like, fucking cool, man. So fucking give it up, man. Yeah, Let's do it. kind of got to uh, sit and shoot the shit. So here's the first clip. This is him talking about the truth about the pay-for-play. I think it was like about five grand for about 13 spins. And people were saying we got like $20,000 and, and for like, you know, 50 spins or something like that. And it was just crazy. And it, 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 that program lasted for maybe a week. So, I mean, the whole thing was done in a week, but it broke that band. You know, it made, made not enough noise. So that's one of the things that definitely gets sort of confused or misconstrued here in this story is there's a lot of people who say it was like $20,000. It was for like 500 different spins. It was, I mean, it was truly just, it was one week. It was 13 plays. And what they did is that when the song was done playing, they just had a disclaimer that said, brought to you by Interscope Records. How was it? So it was like it was an ad. They actually yeah. bought advertising time, and the ad, the ad that they ran was a song instead of an ad saying, hey, we at Interscope Records like to sign bands that do X, Y, Z. They just played the fucking song. Yeah, so they, they played the song, and then this next, which rolls right into this next clip where we're talking about how there was a lot of people who were like, oh, that's Paolo. For anybody who doesn't know, Paolo is illegal. 
uh, the federal government has made it illegal for a record company to go to a radio station and say, here is $10,000, play our song. So uh, their loophole was, it was an advertisement. You know, it just happened to be the full song. And Al said, they played counterfeit anyway. It's not like they weren't already playing it. And it's not, I mean, all that did is that it helped them bring in some money and it helped the record label get some more spins on the song counterfeit. That was it. So, you know, it was 13 extra spins. And he said, so I have a question. I have a question. The label was already playing the song. They, they paid to have it advertised, spun an extra 13 times. But he said that was what broke the band. Was the 13 spins what broke the band or the story that they paid for it? It's a story. Yeah. Okay. The story is really what So does that mean that Interscope, they called Interscope and they said, we've got this idea. Are you going to pay us for an ad? We're going to do the thing. Interscope said, fuck yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And then we're going to blow it up. And we're going to advertise it. We kind of get to that a little bit here. So, so the okay. next thing, this next clip with Al, he's talking about sort of the gray area there, um, because right. that's where a lot of people thought like this was super shady or this was illegal and they should have been doing it is because there was a lot of gray area. And he flat out says right out of the gate in this clip, he's like, there was no gray area because we made sure that there was not gray area here. Yeah. And then he goes into talking about sort of the record label um, radio station relationships that have have been there. Um, that aren't exactly on the level. We made it not ungray because we made it super bright. We shined a light on it. But for years, it's always been all the flyaways you see on the uh, uh, on the radio. You know, here, go here's a trip to go see the sick puppies. You know, the sick puppies paid for that. You know, it's it's and you know you played their record sometimes to get those promotions, and that's that's no secret. That happened all the time. And back when uh, the DOJ got interested in. Um, what was going on, Mr. Mr. Elliot Spitzer and his uh, team came to radio and, and got a hold of a bunch of documents. Uh, this was like 15, 18, 20 years ago. Uh, you know, they found all these irregularities with labels actually spell out in emails, hey, how about three flat screen TVs and a trip to the Bahamas for your winter uh, for, you know, power rotation on this record? And that was all spelled out in all these emails that label guys put on their email. And the DOJ got a hold of it, and, and people lost their jobs, went to jail for that stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah, so the, it was technically all this stuff that was illegal was still going on. Now, what I want to know is, Shim, what fucking trips were you paying people to go on at, oh, when you were in sick puppies? Jesus Christ, man. No. No, I know. I, we never hooked you up and it was a sin. I'll tell you one <laughs> funny thing. I'll tell you one funny thing that the first time that I ever, un, the first time I ever learned about the fine line between promotion and payola was when we were playing uh, uh, Hard Rock Casino and there was a station in the town. And after the show, we went gambling. I don't gamble. And I literally went to the radio, the, the, our record label rep said, hey, the program director from the station's here. We're going to take him out. We're going to have some drinks, you know, schmooze. And I was like, cool. And he said, you know, if you want, go gamble with him. And I like, I, I don't gamble as a rule. I don't like losing money. It's a whole thing. And he said, cool. Here, just take it here. I'll give you, I'll give you like 50 bucks. Just gamble with 50 bucks. I'll put it on the expense account. I was like, okay, great. Cool. Easy. We're gambling and I'm losing because I suck at gambling. I hate it. What were you the playing? The re- program director's next to me. He loses. And I'm like, oh man, we only just kind of got started here. You know, here, take half of my chips. Let's just keep playing. And the promotion, my, my record label guy pulls me by the shirt and goes, no, no, you can't give him money. You can't do that. And I was like, what the fuck? He was like, dude, that's, that's straight up payola. You've got to, you've got to like lose it to him back. And like, you've got to like, and, and, and he just sort of, he just sort of went over to the program director and tapped him on the shoulder. He was like, just, just an F, just, we'll, we'll just keep this between us, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's whatever, it's fine, it's just 25 bucks. But he was full on. He was like, that's exactly what we're not supposed to do. That's cash over. <laughs> like <laughs> on, on camera. Yeah. Like and I was it's... like, oh shit, he was full on. He was like, we can, we can take him gambling and buy him drinks, but we can't give him money. Yeah. That's the, that's the gray, that's not gray. That's the fucking hard line. That is. So like, 
Yeah, it was funny as shit. Anyway, sorry, let's get back to what you were saying. So, what do you mean, anyway? That's a great story. <laughs> like, that's the kind no, of, like... No, I don't want to take right. away from this. This is what people have tuned in to no, see. No, but the they also want to know about the time you got Paola. yelled at for trying to give a program yeah. director 25 bucks. That's a good story. Yeah. It's so, um, it, it's... Al is... This next clip, he's talking about the actual dinner and parts of the story that sort of uh, get left out here in this in here we this, go. Uh, crazy so the, you know we had this kind of uh, inkling of an idea we sat down at this dinner at jake's and it's uh, four of us myself dave knew me uh and uh, a couple of guys from interscope records and we're sitting there and we just start ordering food and drinks and four hours later we wrap this up we finally come to the deal with a certain amount of money for a certain amount of spins no problem he's like calling on the phone to get a hold of, you know, uh, Fred and his manager and stuff like that, making sure it's going to be okay, it all gets done. And then for dessert, I knew these two girls that worked there at the uh, Jake's and they were uh, servers there. And they were also um, bakers, they, they baked. This is way before marijuana was legalized in, in, in Oregon. And they came out and they brought us these huge pot brownies to the table because they were bakers. And this is at Jake's and that's where the president eats when he goes to Portland. And these girls bring out these pop brownies for us, not on the menu, special menu for, for us. And we sat there and ate those. And the guys from Interscope had to go fly. And they go, dude, that was the craziest plane ride home ever after eating that brownie. <laughs> and uh, I, I got lost just getting to my car that night after after eating that brownie. But everything got done. And, and you know, we showed it the next day at work, got it all done. And it, it was crazy. And, and you would never see that. At, at a restaurant back then, pop brownies being brought to the table, but I thought that was so Fantastic. rock and roll, and that was never mentioned in any of the stories. <laughs> so he wanted. Is that to, what upsets him? He's like, yeah. He, he, he <laughs> clearly that's what that's, that's what bothered Al is that nobody talks about the pop brownies that were delivered yeah. that night. I mean, no one talks about how we were cool too, man. <laughs> we fucking rocked it, man. So obviously, the paper pay for play worked. The radio station got the money. The label got the spins and it yeah. got the notoriety for Limp Bizkit, whether good or bad. So I asked Al, "Is um, did you ever do that again with another band? After we did it the first time, it was all of a sudden that was like the call you get. Hey, do you want to do this with this band? And it, it was one of those things is like we looked at it, obviously. We weren't really trying to develop that as a, a program, as a business model. We just wanted to try it, see if it would work. See if, you know, uh, everybody said, oh, this will never work. And we just were kind of being smart pants. I don't know. But uh, afterwards, it, it, nothing really fell into place. We really believed in Lint Biscuit. We believed in that product. Otherwise, we wouldn't have tried it. So it wasn't just, hey, let's pick a band that we can try this with. It's got to be something that we both wholeheartedly, my, myself and our PD, Dave Newmy, wholeheartedly felt that we could get behind. It wasn't going to be something that we, we did that we didn't believe in because our, our main goal was to make the station sound good and always was. And we weren't gonna just grab a piece of crap song to get the money and play it. And that was one thing that we just, it never fell into place like that again. Uh, and we just didn't feel like doing it, going through the trouble. On oh, something else that he, he had mentioned that I don't have necessarily a clip for is that I guess uh, country radio jumped all over this aspect of, of the pay for play where they did it a few yeah. times. And, um, and but like he said there, he's like it never really fell into place again. It's just it was it ran its course. We did it with Limp Bizkit, and then that was about it. Didn't it get made illegal afterwards? Didn't they write new rules afterwards? I don't think so. I think I think it was. So you could legit. still do that now. I could go to KLAQ. Oh, buy now, I, now I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, and now yeah. I'm not in radio, so I don't really care. <laughs> like, right. That's not anything. Fair that's enough. On my radar. That's not a radar. Yeah. However, that I, is really not, that really that really does speak to Al's spirit. The fact that he did a great business move. It wasn't a douche move, but it really was a little bit of a poke to the system of being like, "Yeah, we're gonna fuck, we're gonna fuck this little bit up. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna fucking stir the pot and break the rules, but not quite." But he did it from a place of, yeah, like we believe in this band. We're gonna, we're gonna try to break the band. We're gonna do the right thing. That's what radio is supposed to do, or at least what it says it's supposed to do is support new music, help break artists that really do, that people believe have a career. That's literally what it is designed to facilitate as well as its advertisers. Make advertising money, but also 
you've got the platform, use it, break new bands, take a few risks. That's real. And that speaks yeah, to Al's they, character a lot. Yeah, they don't they do not do that anymore. Radio does not break not new anymore. artists no. at this point. But, but it, I do have a clip of Al yeah. talking about the last time that you were in town when he got to hang out with you. Oh, my really? best is Jim, man. It's, it's great s- seeing him doing stuff. But last time he was here, we went down to uh, downtown Eugene here. He was doing a show with the Sick Puppies, and we had this thing called Sick Puppy Saturday or something like that. And after the promo, we went down, and there was a girl sitting in our uh, our area downtown with a sign that said "Free Hugs." And so, you know, Shim was Shim was like, "Hey, I know that." And so they he went and introduced himself to her, and she was like, "Oh my God, you're the Free Hugs guy." And that's where she got it. Was that Free Hugs thing that Shim had done? Free that's sweet. Routine, no, right? I remember that. Yeah. Every time, every time someone has a free hug sign, I make a point of giving them a free hug and make a thing. Cause that was, especially by the time that I, the last time I saw Al, that video was eight years old by that point. The fact that people still remember is really dope. But yeah, I love Al, bless. If you're listening, man, let's do it again sometime. I'm telling you, we gotta have Al on, man. Cause he's got, he's got to have stories for days. Just, mm. on, I mean, he was he was always so cool to talk to, to ask questions about, you know, stuff the way that it was back in the uh, the nineties and and you know, the, especially the grunge movement, being up in the northwest, like he was there for all of that shit. Yeah, hundred percent. All right, so coming back to Limp Bizkit back to now, Limp Bizkit. back to my back to my pickup. The album Three Dollar Bill Y'all was met with minimal response. All music writer Stephen Thomas, Earlwine, fuck, Earlwine, Stephen Thomas wrote they might not have many original ideas but they do the sound well they have a powerful rhythm section and memorable hooks most of which make up for the uneven songwriting i actually would agree with a lot of that (laughs) so despite the minimal response though durst was appointed senior vice president of a and r at interscope so this gave him the power to basically sign or find and sign new bands which led to this issue with the one that always comes to my mind is taproot are you familiar with this story i know taproot i loved their first album um this we song played one... is a home to myself fucking love yeah. that album i just i i didn't know that fred durst was involved in that i knew puddle of mud and stain that was it oh, so yeah. taproot Taproot felt the deal wasn't a good one. It said that Taproot would make three songs for Interscope. If the label liked the songs, they would give them a full record deal. If they didn't like the songs, Taproot would not be signed, but Interscope would keep the rights to those songs. So What's I'm asking that? you as a as an artist, is, is like, does that deal sound that outrageous to you? No, it sounds like no, it doesn't sound the the idea of the label owning the rights to something they paid for is like, well, duh, like they're not going to give that shit away. You I've had deals at the very beginning of my career where um, usually what they would do is they would say, hey, we're going to pay for you to record some songs. Here's a proper studio. Here's five days. Here's a producer, you know, 15 grand up front. And then at the end of it, you could easily negotiate and say, well, if you decide you don't want to release them, we want them. And if you don't give them to us at the end of it, we're not going to sign. And most labels would say, well, if we don't want it, we're not going to do anything with it anyway. Fine. Let's just roll the dice. Mm -hmm. So the band could have easily turned around and said, no, we want to, we want to negotiate that point. No, but the idea that's very typical stuff. Taproot, you go in, you say, we like the band, go and record the songs because a band live is very different to a band on recording. There are people never understand that sometimes bands sound great live that just doesn't translate on record. And that is the exact reason why producers exist to translate the sound and energy onto a record. And if they don't translate, label's not going to fucking sign you. So roll with it. Sorry. (laughs) Keep rolling, 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 rolling. Yeah. So this led to Taproot not taking the deal. Um, and it, there's this voicemail. You can find it online. It actually, if you look up on YouTube, you can find the whole voicemail of Fred where he calls up Taproot and he's like, you guys fucked up. You guys are done in this business. You don't bite the hand that feeds. How fucking dare you do this? Like, it's fucking over. You better not fucking come to my shows because you guys are fucking done. Like, yeah. And I, and I remember this story being so big back then, too, because... I, I think I was in radio at this time. I think when Taproot's album came out, I just started at the college radio station. And there was a tour which was Deftones, Incubus, Taproot. Oh. 
And oh yeah, it was a good, it was a good fucking show. Like, it was really good. Dude, really good. that was the thing that dro- I cannot tell you how much it drove me fucking insane to see those tours happening in the states, and they never came to Australia. Maybe every once in a while, one of the bands would come through, and they'd, and then you'd have some shitty Australian bands opening for them, and the tickets were five times what they would have been in El Paso, just to get like, them to come I, down there. Just, just to get them to come down, because if you put all the expenses and and everything together. And I just, it would drive me nuts that you'd be like, I could see three of the dopest bands in the moment. And it was, yeah, it was so, I mean, I remember when Head P.E. Oh. came through town. Head P.E. Hey, bartender, <laughs> when, hit me with yeah. another. And the thing that made the, the show was terrible. I just about was terrible. this, brother. What? Yeah, dude, that, that band was amazing. I love that band when their stuff came out. And the, the, the word on the street was, I didn't make the show I found out afterwards. I got into the band after they'd already been through town. They played a little club. But the infamy was he got, uh, he nearly died on heroin out the back of the club because he got some drugs from someone. The the club was in King's Cross, which was, it's where you go to get drugs. But the stuff was too strong for him. They were like, yeah, in Australia, we just have, they apparently they have straight heroin. Like they don't water it down as much as they do in the fucking ghetto that he came from. So he got his normal heroin and then and nearly fucking OD'd because it was real shit instead of the watered down stuff that he's used to getting. And the funny thing is that the owners of the club and the dealers took pride in it. They didn't go, oh no, we might have <laughs> fucked up. They were like, fucking Yankees can't handle their heroin. Shit, like, fucking it was, can't that, handle the heroin, dropping up their food like a bunch of fucking babies. Yeah. <laughs> Limp Bizkit continued to tour and even headlined the Ladies' Night in Cambodia club tour in which they offered free tickets to women. This successfully increased the band's female audience, of course. I'm telling you, the, mar- he's, he's the marketing and everything that they did, it, 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 yeah. was, it was spot on. They did well. So their yeah, cover of Faith totally. ended up getting heavy radio play. This earned them a spot on OzFest. And yes, we are going to cover OzFest. So what I'm thinking we'll do here is that... Once we're wrapping up with Limp Bizkit in the future, when we're going to do Significant Other, from there we will jump to Ozfest, cover that, and then we'll go back to Corn. From which Corn we will then move into Family Values, which leads yes. right into your next your next little note. And after Ozfest, after Ozfest, they took a break from the road, eventually performing on Corn's Family Values tour. Yeah, I, I still remember the ads that MTV ran. Is they did they had a whole special yeah. that was about the Family Values tour because I believe it was Corn, Limp Bizkit, Ice Cube, Rammstein. Uh, I think Orgy was on that one as well. What but a great the ad, tour, man! They were doing a giveaway for it. It was a trip to Europe for a, like a Family Values experience, and it's so funny because in the ad they even talk about we're going to give you a camcorder and a VH or and a VCR so that you can record and relive your memories. It's like oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but the way that the ad started out, it's like an old 1950s style sort of cartoon looking thing where they're talking about how, could you hand me some corn or would you like more corn? Well, no, I'm actually a little full, but my drink could use another ice cube. And then the kid's like, oh, I don't want this biscuit. It's limp. And, right. <laughs> and the whole like, I, I think I remember that, actually. It yeah. still sticks out to me this day, that exact uh, that exact commercial. So Durst. He ended up directing uh, a video for Faith, which I, I think a lot of the footage was shot for the one that, that ended up making the airplay on the Family Values Tour because uh, right. he recorded a first one. He did a first one. He didn't like it, so he did a second one, which was kind of a tribute to some of the tour mates like Primus and Deftones and Korn, which I think was the one that was pretty heavily involved with um, uh, uh, the Family Values Tour. And I always – I used to refer to that. I used to refer to Fred Durst when uh, I, I've – when I directed the Free Hugs video, it got the band, it got Sick Puppy signed, blew us up, first viral video in history, blah, blah, blah. I never understood. I, I could never get them to let me fucking direct another music video. Several times I'd go in and I'd be like, okay, I got this idea. It's got this and this. I don't know about a budget, but like if we can, if we can do this one, we can work it out. I wrote it and I, it was always the people at the label had someone else that they already wanted to give the job to. They didn't want to give it to me. And in my head, I'm thinking like, dude, you can don't pay me. Like you're going to pay a director 20 grand to make a music video for us. Just don't pay me and you save 20 grand, which really means I save 20 grand, but that's a whole nother fucking thing. But they would, they literally were like, no, no, no. We've got our people that we owe favors and we, we outsource to this and that. And we've got our thing. Like I kept telling them like, dude, Fred Durst makes all the videos for Limp Bizkit. They're great. He has a vision. I have a vision. They would never connect the dots. 
And I'm like, dude, what, <laughs> so I can do one. I can do the one that was the biggest video the band ever had. But when it comes to doing it again, it, I could never pull it off. I never fully understood why. Back to the biscuit. Back to the biscuit. Yeah! Borland stated in an interview that George Michael hated their cover of the song and hates us for doing it. Well, what <laughs> do you think? Like, seriously, their song had no real musicality to it. George Michael is one of what the greatest singers about and that musicians. Intro, that intro, that intro, that down, 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 Yeah, down. no, come on. Like, I get well, what it was. I guess it would be nice if I could yeah. touch your body. I know this not is the thing that always has got I a body like me. Where did the yodeling come from? What? Please stop. Before I <laughs> Where did my the... heart away. No, and you're not I singing it correctly. Because this was the thing that always freaked me out. Because I played when, he's, when, when he would come up, oh, he would I sing with some. this yodel. He would sing with the yodel. And I would always be like, why does everyone think this guy's hardcore? Why does everyone think he's so masculine? Because he would sing, with I touch your body. He would have this whole, I get that everybody. He would like do a yodel up to the top part of the nodal time. And I was like, where the fuck is this shit coming from? And everyone has just stopped watching because both of us just poorly sang fake. You for longer than we should have. What? On this day, no, July dude, no, 1st, hey, 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 1997. No. Hold on. Before we get to the on this date, I want people to comment below what you really thought of my oh, version please. of faith. Thumbs up. Go ahead and comment on what you thought of Brandon's version of faith. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so on this date, July 1st, 97, god damn, $3 bill y'all was released. Do you say $3 bill or $3 bill y'all? I say both. Um, I actually, I was doing, a, I was working on a short um, that I, at the beginning, oh, it's the one that we did where we talk about uh, which one has uh, Janine Linda Mulder on the cover. Yeah. And yep. the first time I say $3 bill, and then after that's $3 bill y'all. So, I mean, it's, yep. I've heard people also say it's $3 bill y'alls, because there's technically a, a, a dollar sign. Um after the oh L's. okay but here's the thing that what what where did that title come from we didn't talk about that oh, at all where fuck. did it come I from thought I, I thought i had that in there so basically his whole thing again was kind of like how do we turn people away like right. the kind of people that would see this and be like either shocked or disgusted and then are like this band must suck those are the people we don't want listening to our music we want the right. people who are going to see it and they'll be like oh i'll give it a shot Right. It was, it was okay, kind of so everything was thing. designed. It was the, kind of the same the, thing with the band name. Yeah. Isn't that amazing that that's the exact opposite? The 180 opposite of how everything's done now. It's like, I need to figure out how to get people to look at me. Yeah. And how do people like me? But and it, his and whole thing was, how do I make people fucking hate me? It and worked. that would and work still, now. And they're still performing at fucking Lollapalooza to gigantic ass yeah. crowds, man. Yeah. Dressed like that. Fuck. Yeah. There you go. You can take okay. the first one here on this. Uh, on this. Date. On this date, Hong Kong was returned to China after 156 years of British rule. So we're going to deep dive into the politics of those years. Kidding. Yeah, we're just joking. We're not going to really be doing on this date anymore because that's kind of what we're doing with the remix. So rather than yeah. trying to double it up, we're just going to wrap up these episodes as is. As far as uh, continued education, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that you can find um, that have a lot to do. That go even more depth on some of the smaller stories here, like the, uh, the crash that happened when they were driving their van and how Borland ended up coming back to the band and after stuff like that. But we're already running over. So let's wrap up this Big episode. Time. Go ahead and like, comment, follow, subscribe, do all the usual stuff. Please let us know in the comments if you think we said anything that was complete bollocks that you would like to disagree with because, after all, it is Limp Biscuit. And in the meantime, his yeah. name is Brandon. He's the DJ. His name is Shim. He's the rock star. Class. Dismissed. Thank you. All right. Encore time, buddy. Encore time. Can I uh, take a piss? God. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. Of a fucking yeah, I know, baby. I know. I know. You just sorry. Right. You talk to them in the meantime. You oh love my it. You god, love this, it. dude. Seriously. So we recorded the remix episode before this. He took a leak before we recorded that. He took another leak after we recorded that, and then he took another leak before we started recording this. That's four fucking times. He might need to go to a doctor. I'm just saying there might be something going on with him. I know he's drinking his water and he's drinking his his uh his coffee there i mean it'll happen to me because i mean as we're recording this it's like 8 15 at night here in el paso texas which means it is i got it on my phone here it is it's actually just past noon in sydney australia mate and it'll happen to me i drink matcha tea in the morning and when i'm drinking that stuff um really what i do is i mix up one first 
And then as I do, and you know how like, you know something that I just realized I forgot to mention (laughs) something that I realized I forgot to mention is I did, I totally forgot about it. I did a cover of freedom by George Michael that is on my Patreon because of that song. Hold on. I was in the middle of a story. You're fucking rude. Oh. <laughs> so what I do is Sorry. I take my matcha tea and then I, I, I make a full cup. And then when I get down like halfway, I go, I take, I boil my water and then I add some more in and then I go through a whole one of those. And so I understand why Shim has to take like four pisses. At See, my, 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 my interruption in was way more interesting than that. So, <laughs> I mean, no. I literally was like, yo, I've got a cover that no one's heard of Freedom by George Michael and it's dope. I spent like a month on it when I was 18 and it was I done on a 16 I track recorder with program drums. I I I I I I I so what else? Did you re did you redo it or is it the, it's the version you did when you were 18? No, the version I did when I was 18 is what's on the Patreon. The dev, I'm not going to redo that shit. Huh. Um no, be, because be a man. I, I I I can't the idea of like redoing or I've thought about it. I've been like, I've gone back through. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've thought about, <laughs> I've thought about going back into some of the old stuff and being like, all right, I'll re-record this and this and that. But the truth is every time I write a new song, I'm like, well, that's just a better song. Why would I go to the point of writing like on my old songs? There's a, there's a few that have moments of inspiration, but in general, I can write better songs now. I'd rather just write a new song, produce a new song. Fuck it. That working out well for you. The first one's going to be the investor share NFT. That song is coming together nicely. You don't give a shit. It's going to be amazing. Wait till you hear it. It's going to be um, great. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, so I've got some some events coming up here. Although by the time this episode drops, it would have already happened. Do you want to play what Fall events? Guys on Thursday? No, not that game. No, I can't. It makes me upset. <sighs> because we're doing Sorry. a full, like, I've had multiple people reach out to me on social media. And they're like, hey, so I heard you were playing Fall Guys. How can, how can we, how can we play? Is it cool if we can play with you? So yeah, I put out a post last week kind of saying, this is, uh, um, you know, this is what I'm looking to do. I'm going to, I'm going to look to play some fall guys at this point. And, uh, I've, I've had, you know, a bunch of people because so the way that fall guys worked is you need to have a, you can have four and then be put Mm. in a group with random people. But if you want to do your own private game, you have to have a minimum of 10. So like that one night we were playing the game, we were trying to figure out how the fuck can we get. Uh, yeah. how, how can we get at least 10 people? So I've had a lot of people reach out to me. We're going to get at least 10. We can have up to 60. So we're doing this on Thursday. Again, this would have been last Thursday when you're at least hearing this because this episode doesn't drop until Monday, uh, right. August 29th, I believe is the date. Yeah. Uh, and then on Friday, um, there's the guy that won the t-shirt from the, remember in the one episode, there was like a blip. And I put the I put the screen uh, the text up saying, "Hey, if you're actually paying attention to this, just shoot me a message that just mm-hmm. says Shim broke it, and then you win a T-shirt." And he was the first one that yeah. sent me the message. I've had his right. damn t- he he picked a, um, a cross-eyed bear shirt. I've had the damn thing just sitting at the house, and because he like he's in El Paso, but he's like way right. the fuck out on the east side. So we've tried to connect a few times, have never quite made it happen. So I started to think about it and I'm like, I've had some other people, you know, ask about doing like a hangout or something. So uh, this Friday, uh, the wife and I, we're going to go hang out at this uh, kind of arcade bar called Rubik's and we're just going to, anybody who wants to come fucking hang, I'm going to make a thumbnail or like a a picture and we're going to advertise it this week to kind of let people know if they want to show up. Because apparently people still remember remember me from KLAQ. We were at the soccer game on Saturday Mm -hmm. and I had a a hankering for some elote. Which is basically it's like corn in a cup, and right. so I'm I got I got I probably look like it's a lost idiot just looking around where I can find it uh, at, at the right. stadium, and so the, I hear this dude go, "Miss you on the queue, man." I mean, it's been a year. Like it was, it was, it was the beginning of August last year. So I'm like, what? And so then I turned and I was like, oh, and and the guy's walking towards me. and He goes, "Miss you on the queue," and he reaches his hand out. So we shake our hands. But I think he had somewhere to be because he just kind of kept going. And he just turns around and he's like, miss you, man. And just kind of kept right. going. Nice. Yeah. Beautiful. So That must have been lovely. So then right after – yeah, it always feels good when people say that. Um, yeah. So right after that, I got my elote, corn in a cup. It's fucking amazing. Um, although that's like – like with all the good food at Southwest University Park, like that's something you guys might want to step up a little bit there. But anyway. So I was telling my wife the story. And I'm, I'm 
trying not to say it too loud because if you talk like talk about stuff like that in public, you can kind of come off like a douchebag. Like, right. oh, this guy, this guy recognized me down there. Like, you know what I mean? So I thought I was saying it's quiet enough, but apparently right. the dude in front of me heard me, and he right. kind of turns around. And he goes, "I thought that was you." And he goes, "Yeah, you are, Miss Man." And then he gives me some <laughs> some knucks, and I'm like, "Oh, like fucking cool, man!" Like, I didn't realize you guys all fucking missed me. So, I mean, yeah, I still you did get good, people. I still get people that do message and, and people that are that are still upset about me not being there. But I'm like, well, you know, life moves on. Life moves and, on, oh, and it's funny when you – oh, shit. And okay. the whole point of that, too, is now I figured out – I remembered I need to start traveling with stickers. That would have been a perfect time to hand out my fucking stickers. Oh, yeah, man. That's, like why That's you a good all, point. Like, like I've, I've told my wife countless times, always make sure you have your business cards on you. Always make sure right, you have right. your business cards. Yeah, I, yeah. I, for Christmas last year, one of her gifts, I bought her this really nice fucking business card holder. So right. I want to make sure, and, and I'm the fucking idiot that I've had these two guys recognize me, and I didn't have any any merch to give them. So that's also yeah, kind of one that's of the things true. for this you know Friday is I can though? go hand out the merch. One thing you can do, which I, which I do with Investor Share, is uh, you put a QR code in your photos, and then you can just go to your photos and be like, yo, scan this, and it'll take them straight to the YouTube page or wherever you want to take them. And they can just go, oh, cool. And they, they do that. They save the link. And they're like, yeah, I'll check it out later. Yeah. And that's that's kind of like a business card. Yeah. Yeah, but I was yeah, in that well, moment where I, was like, I was like, fuck, I should have had a fucking my stickers with me, man. I got, I got to remember. The amount of things. Do you know the amount of fucking times that I wonder if Fred Durst had been on stage and he just would have been like, ladies, I want to tell you what's going on, man. What? And they just would have been like, yeah. Oh, probably. Like, oh, today's. Like, yeah. Yeah. But like, <sighs> he, yeah, you couldn't understand. You you could mistake that. Like, I remember seeing. Did I tell you about what I used to do when I was on tour with Nickelback? What? Did I tell? Look at this photograph. Would no, you take photographs? I used and sing to. That? He would. I remember he. Chad would be up there and it, it, it was the same shit every night. Like there was the same song, same shtick in between the things. And so before a couple of like, he had this thing, like maybe four or five times during the night, he would say like, I think it's about time we pick this show up. What do you say? And he would always have that same inflection or he'd be like, I think we got to do one for the ladies, guys. What do you say? And they go, yeah. And I was like, dude, that, that, like I, there was times when I'd be walking at the back and I'd hear like, and I'd be like, yeah. And I'd be like, oh, it doesn't matter what he said. It's he just has to say, what it's do you the, say? Yeah, so I swear to God, there were times when I would do this and I fucking, I swear to God, no one ever picked up on it. I'd finish a song and I'd be like, oh, fucking, there's an up tempo coming up on the next song. And I go, I think it's all the ball jones to going town now. What do you say? And they go, <laughs> yeah. And it would, I would literally just speak gibberish. And they would fucking do it. It wouldn't matter what I said. They would just fucking go crazy. And I started doing that all the time. I used to put on like a southern. I think it's time to get some corn ass already up in this mother. What you say? Like I would just. If I was in Texas, I'd ask for carne asada. If I was in fucking Alaska, I'd ask for salmon. But I talk like that. I said, don't know the salmon or the fresh trout. What you say? Every fucking time. Oh and they God. wouldn't know what the fuck I was saying. The only people who could tell would be the band of the crew. And they'd be like, I wonder what he's going to fucking say this time. But so the Every band time. of the crew, did they know? Like, yeah, he's just yeah. got their bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Because be, there was a couple of times, like, I, I used to be, I, I ripped off Chad and I'd be like, I think it's time to pick it up. What do you say? And the and the crew would go, oh, they're going into that song. And then one time I I went, a song but don't bone bone to bone. What do you say? And the crew guy came up, he was like, Did you just say some random shit? And I was like, Yeah, you you noticed? It was like, Yeah, but that's only because I see you every night. They fucking went crazy for that. I was like, Yeah. And so I started, and then it became a joke on tour. Oh my god. There was a whole fucking run where I did that. And then I that's realized that it might you need be to write a song called What Do You yeah. Say? What do you say? Oh, <laughs> What do you yeah. say? What do you say? Yeah, oh, that's what I should do. That's a good story, man. All right, we got to wrap up, though. We got to wrap right, it's up. Coming up. Coming up next week, we're going to get to uh, Limp Bizkit Significant Other. It's probably going to take two episodes. Two. And uh, be on the lookout for the remixes and all that fun stuff. Make sure you're checking out the socials. A lot of good tracks. And the on shorts. Some, the shorts are doing really well, man. I had, I had one that I did about Disney's American flags that got like 14,000 views in an hour. So... 
It's pretty Fucking pleased a. about that. Awesome. Pretty pleased about that. So yeah, go like Excellent. our shit at the Real Brandalorian. Like I've I've got people commenting on my YouTube now. They're like, but I'm I'm just commenting now before you make it big because this channel's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, you might be trolling, but all right, I'll bite. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. Look, look, as much as I know, like, look, I have all the confidence in my work ethic. I have all the confidence in my work. There's still a part of me that's always just like, really? Like, you think you're going to make really it that, like, like, you're really going to make it that big? Like, you're really going to be like, do you really, like, how far do you really think you're going to take this social media stuff? How far do this you is, really think? You, you within your head is yeah. saying this? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, look, I like, and there's a reason I, I bust my ass at it. Like, I, I, this is the shit that I'm working on fucking hardcore. I'm getting to two videos done every single day. And uh, one usually with you, which we can use to promote history of rock. And then one some more to uh, some other tidbits. I've got the, uh, the live streams that I'm doing with my buddy, Alan and Frank and Twitchy. And um, yeah, so I, I mean, and like shit, I, like I gained a hundred subscribers last week on YouTube, which I'm I'm able to kind of look at how it was when I was running OG Life's social medias, and yeah. less than two months into OG Life, getting a hundred subscribers in one week was fucking unheard of. Like that that didn't happen for months. So to get that now right. is a nice big leap. But there's still this part yeah. of me that's like, like really like you've worked in radio for 20 years. You kind of made a name for yourself. You're really good at what you did. But like, do you really think you're going to become this big? social media or youtube something it's like there's a that part of me that, that thinks that and, and then the, the rest of me just has to be shut the fuck up like i'm gonna keep doing this yeah you know yeah well i think sometimes that voice is good when you if it keeps you motivated if it yeah, keeps no, it you does. if it, it keeps you on edge it definitely and there's yeah. a lot of things that even right now that are fucking motivating the shit out of me so yeah that's great yeah. dude no yeah no i have i have the same thing where i'm like well uh there, there are two things that come up when that shit comes to me where I, I haven't dealt with that for a long time. My ego was off the chain when I was younger. I just you believed. Don't say. I just had absolute. It I, does I, not I was, show. I was shocked. I would truly be shocked and insulted when someone would question that I was going to be a successful rock star. I really fucking was shocked. I'd be like, and the reason was logical. This is the weird thing. Mm. I never looked at them like, oh no, I'm amazing. You just don't get, I literally would look at them. I'm like, well, how do you know? You say it with such certainty, like, oh no, no. Well, you're never going to be top of the chain. You're never going to play out. You know, you're never going to open for big bands and play fucking sold out shows. But like, how the fuck do you know? Why would you say that? And I would always be like, that's you and your shit. I'm doing my thing. I'm going to fucking die trying. But the idea that you can say like, oh, no, no, you can't. Like, what? there's no basis. There's nothing. You haven't, even if you'd seen me, if you'd seen me play live and I sucked, then you might be able to go, you got a long way to go before you're going to get to that mountaintop you keep talking about. But you'd at least go, well, he's fucking doing it. The amount of times that people, I had people actually come to me at the very beginning of my career and they said, it's going to take you 10 years, but I've got absolute faith you'll make it. Cause you're fucking relentless. And they were, and they were politely saying, you don't sound that good yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but, no, but, but you're going to fucking still, go there. Yeah. But they're still supporting you by saying it that way. Yeah. Like there's different ways yeah. to say it. And that's a good way to support. So look for anybody listening out there, if you have somebody who is striving for something, it could be in, in performance, it could be in athletics, it could be uh, something uh, more educational, like academics, that that's a, a way you like, look, I have every, um, I believe in you a hundred percent. It might just take you a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. There's always great constructive ways to say it, but the idea that someone says to me, well, you like for me, the idea of like being a good father or being a better provider than I ever have been or making more money than I ever planned to. I'm like, no, I'm going to make this much money. And money's a big one because they're like, oh no, you can't talk about money. Like you can't think about money. Like, and I'm like, no, I have a whole private fucking plan and strategy for long goal stuff that I don't talk to anyone about except my wife. It's prostitution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be only, everyone keeps asking for an only fan. It's not it's that red light. No, like, no, it's remember, it's remember the old red light story that you had. Like when you had that, that's red right. Light, dude. No, it's, it's your own brothel. That's I, dude. It's so easy. It, I could, I would have been such a good pimp. I would have been such <laughs> oh, no, a good you pimp. You weren't the pimp. You'd be the whore. I'd be both. 
<laughs> look, look, just watch me on stage one time. I am both. <laughs> Oh, oh shit, we really got to wrap it up. It's an hour. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God damn it. We All right, we'll see you guys later. Thank you very much. Peace out, everybody.